Welcome to another Ag Gateway Global Network video. I'm Jim Wilson, President of Ag Gateway Global Network, and with me is Stuart Ray from Ag Connections. Stuart will present an ADAPT data model overview. Stuart, please tell us what you do for Ag Connections and Ag Gateway, and then move into your presentation. Thank you, Jim. Good morning. As Jim said, my name is Stuart Ray. I'm a software developer for Ag Connections in Murray, Kentucky. Ag Connections is a FMIS, Farm Management Information System provider. We're grower oriented, so we make software essentially for the grower to use in record keeping and managing this data. I also happen to be the data model lead in the ADAPT project, and it's my honor to talk with you today about the data model for ADAPT and how it came to be. So let's get started. My goal today is really to tell you a story about how we got to where we are and maybe why we made some of the decisions that we did in constructing the data model and designing the data model. And with that, let's get into the slides. Before we begin, let's take a moment to manage some expectations. This is a high-level overview of the model. We'll come back in later webinars and get into more detail about the individual pieces of it. But for now, you know, this is a high level, and as such, this webinar may run a little shorter than others. Uh, secondly, this is very much work in progress. The model and the ADAPT project is still under development, and it's going to continue to change simply because it's the nature of the business. Agriculture is evolving and there's more data being collected every day. So it makes sense that this model will continue to evolve and will continue to make progress. It's also the result of work from kind of a core group of individuals within the Precision Ag Council of Ag Gateway. And as such, you know, there are going to be holes in it. It may not meet all of your needs. And really, part of the purpose for doing these webinars is to invite you to come write your own chapter in this story and help us in developing this model and developing this open source project into something that's, quite frankly, we think is going to revolutionize the industry. So that being said, the general topics we're going to cover today is, you know, what is ADAPT and how do we expect it to be used? Now, although there'll be some other webinars covering that kind of things in more detail, this is kind of to give you some context for where we are right now. And then we'll step back a bit and we'll look at the problems that we're trying to solve and the requirements that were necessary for the ADAPT project and how that informed the design of the data model. ADAPT stands for the Ag Data Application Programming Toolkit. So what does ADAPT contain? Well, it contains a common object model for field operations, a plug-in management framework that will support that model, and then a set of data conversion plugins, both open source plugins and proprietary plugins, that are going to do the heavy lifting for converting and transforming data from one format into the common object model. Some things that are missing from ADAPT and missing on purpose is that, you know, ADAPT does not contain a file transfer mechanism. There, you know, is nothing within the ADAPT code that is going to open a web connection or FTTP connection or connect to cloud provider. Nothing inherent in ADAPT that will do that. There's also no authentication or authorization mechanism built into ADAPT. There's no logic for a framework for sharing data or permissioning data. That's something that was left out of scope by design. There's also no or very little computational logic. First and foremost, ADAPT is really a common object model. It's a common set of business objects that we can all share, that we're all responsible for mapping our internal business objects into. And as such, you know, we really expect the computation to be done on either the plug-in side or on the FMIS side. So ADAPT itself really isn't going to be calculating things. It's going to be transforming data from one form to another so that it's more easily consumable. What we see here is a diagram a kind of general overview of how we accept ADAPT to be used. You see from the diagram that there are two workflows illustrated. 
The blue arrows show an FMIS to FMIS communication example. FMIS A wishes to communicate with FMIS B, so it loads data from its internal business objects, so the internal representation of grower, the internal representation of farm and of field. It maps those internal objects into the ADAPT common object model and then hands that data to the ADAPT serialization plugin that then serializes that data to file or to whatever and passes it to FMISB. Where the reverse happens, FMISB takes that data and maps it from the ADAPT business objects into its own. We also see the second workflow, which is the second way ADAPT, we envision ADAPT being used, which is to take proprietary data coming from a mobile information control system and mapping that into the ADAPT common object model. What this does is relieves the burden that FMIS often have on integrating with multiple hardware vendors. So the idea being that an FMIS could integrate once to ADAPT, and then by use of these proprietary plugins, be able to consume data from other systems without having to know the technical details of each. The problem that we were trying to address in designing ADAPT the way we had, growers need to collect an increasing amount of field operation data. That's not just true here in the U.S., but around the world. This usually contains significant amounts of frequently changing information. Based on what jurisdiction you're in, you may have a really high regulatory burden or not. There's a lot of data to be collected. Compounding that, there's an inconsistent vocabulary in the industry. Words like work order or field are kind of charged because everyone has their own definition for it. So some of the initial problems that we faced really had to do with it kind of getting on the same page and talking in the same terms. For one stakeholder, a work order might mean go do this series of different things on this series of fields uh, where you're doing something different on each field. Whereas to another stakeholder, a work order might mean doing the same thing on one or only one or multiple fields. So one of the challenges that we had in starting, and one of the challenges we continue to have, is kind of some inconsistent vocabulary in describing what's actually occurring on the field. Capturing all of this data in a single object model is really a moving target because things continue to change. And what we looked for was a way to decouple the infrequently changing things, things that we would expect to be very stable like every farm, every field, we should probably have a name. They should probably have an identifier, a fixed identifier of some kind. They should probably have, you know, some hierarchy behind it where uh, it's organized as a grower or a client or whatever term you choose to use has farms under it and those farms have fields under them. There was some commonality that we looked for. But we also accept the fact that you know, there were some things that would be different, not just from in between software packages or OEMs, but also in different areas of the world. So in terms of requirements that were placed on the data model, we had some conflicting things going on. We needed a model that was simple enough, generic enough, that everybody would want to use it but it was complete enough to be able to address the business processes that are behind production agriculture today. It was also specific enough to meet the regulatory needs of people. In the U.S., you can't really use a restricted crop protection product without knowing its EPA number, you know, without being able to record that information. But that kind of information was useless in Europe. So why would we clutter the model by having these things that were very regionally specific? We needed a way to break these things apart and keep the model as light and generic and simple as possible, but still have the ability to attach the data that was necessary to support these business processes. We also had the requirement that developers in general, and I feel confident saying this because I am one, like a stable platform. They don't want the model shifting out from under us in kind of radical ways. 
But at the same time, you know, recognize that the industry continues to evolve and there's more data being collected and there's the need to be flexible and to be dynamic and to be able to capture the reality of things. So again, a conflicting requirement of stability versus the dynamically changing landscape. We also wanted to use a controlled vocabulary so that everyone would know what the other person was talking about. And this has turned out to be a really big deal and the cornerstone of our development because without a common vocabulary, transferring data from one system to another just doesn't work. At the same time, that vocabulary needs to be extensible. We need to be able to not change the definition of things, but add definitions in, in a really easy fashion. So these are the requirements that we were looking at as we began to think about designing the data model for ADAPT. This resulted in a number of goals that we established for the ADAPT project. We wanted to enable communications between the MICS systems and the farm management systems, as well as among different FMISs. We've already seen that in the diagram. We needed to meet the requirements of Ag Gateway's SPADE and PAIL projects while maintaining compatibility with ISO 11783 and the participant company's own systems. The SPADE series of projects were originated from the Precision Ag Council that was founded in Ag Gateway of around 2010. The SPADE projects compiled a number of use cases and requirements revolving around the planting and crop care and harvest field operations. A sibling a series of projects called PAIL focused mainly on irrigation and contributed to the requirements for ADAPT as well. That gateway by its nature doesn't look to create standards where standards already exist. So when we first started looking at doing something in the field operations space, it was natural for us to look at ISO 11783, which was the existing standard for equipment communication in the ag industry. Our early attempts of analyzing 11783 showed that there were some gaps for our uses, things like recommendations and crop plans which figure in to ADAPT, and we'll see a little bit later in this presentation, it didn't really have relevance in machine-to-machine -machine communication, which was the focus of 11783. So rather than trying to hammer a square peg in a round hole, we decided instead to create ADAPT and go our own way while maintaining compatibility with 11783 because it is de facto industry standard for communicating with the hardware. And that was something that we were interested in preserving and interested in doing. Also part of ADAPT's design was the desire to be geopolitical context independent which is kind of a fancy way of saying we're really looking at international use on as broad a scale as possible. Much of ADAPT's power lies in its common object model. This is where the bulk of our work really resides. The initial cut of the module was overly large and it was heavily skewed towards North America. When we first got together, everyone brought their own internal object model really we threw everything in the kitchen sink into the initial cut. That model was overly large. It was kind of bloated. It was hard to use and confusing. Not only because everyone had their own terms for the same piece of data, but also because, again, it was heavily skewed towards North America. And we realized that if we really wanted some international traction, it needed to lose that regionally specific stuff. which became the ADAPT's common object model. And the geopolitical context-dependent data was spun off into a separate context item system. This context item system is essentially a glorified key value pair that allows us to tag this geopolitical context-dependent data onto objects in the common object model as they're needed. We'll see a little bit more about that later in the presentation, as well as other webinars will address the context item system in detail. The root object of the ADAPT common object model is the application data model. This is the package that will be handed to a plug-in in order to be translated on export to go out to a field controller. 
It's also the object that will come in from a plugin on import coming from a field controller or another FMIS. This is the container object, the root container object for the model. The application data model includes a set of proprietary values that allow you to pass configuration parameters along with a catalog, a collection of documents, and a collection of reference layers. One of the important things to note is that in the application data model, we're trying to model as best we can how data is currently passed around in systems. A lot of times that data is passed via a card or a USB stick. That's what we've tried to model here. The catalog, like its name implies, is essentially a filing cabinet that contains all the various objects you would expect to be part of information that you would exchange. You have the grower object, which has an ID, a name, contact info, and set of context items, as well as a farm, as well as farms, fields, crop zones, and products. The catalog object, as I said, is like a filing cabinet. It is what holds all these objects that you would expect maybe to see in a pick list or a drop down list on a field controller. Were you to be exporting data to a field controller, this is where that data would go. If you were importing data from a field controller, this is where the information for the fields that were used in the data that was collected, the, the products that were used in the data that's collected would reside. One of the debates that we had in creating this common object model centered around using things by reference and using things by value. It was decided that because the volume of data that we were looking to represent could be quite large, we decided that using things by reference was probably the best bet. So what you will find in the model is a lot of ID ref objects, which point to the IDs of these objects you find here in the catalog. IDs are compound identifiers. There will be a separate webinar on those later. But essentially, it's a local ID to which is attached a number of unique identifiers, one or more, actually. So it's possible in the process of exchanging data for you to attach your internal identifier for an object. And the person you're exchanging with also attach their unique identifier for the same object onto the same field, for example. That way, as data is exchanged back and forth, you each always know your own internal identifier. Attached to uh, many of the objects inside the catalog are collections of context items. A context item is, as you see here, a code, which would be the key, and the value units of measures and so forth, which would represent the value. A code identifies what a given context item contains. Think of it as a number that identifies what the value means. Is it a FSA tract ID? Is it an EPA number? Is it a California permit ID? This code is contained, it points to a context item definition, which is provided by a reference data service called the context item system. There will be an additional webinar that explains more about that system later, but Suffice to say, for now, this is a way of tagging additional context-dependent information to objects within the common object model. So if our FMIS contains a tax ID for a grower, we're able to attach that tax ID via a context item to the grower object within DAPT. That may mean nothing for our friends in Australia or our friends in Europe. But for North America, it's relevant. This gives us an amazing amount of flexibility in being able to express information that's relevant for local areas and executing your business processes, while not cluttering the common object model as a whole with those particular pieces of information. As I said, the context items are provided, their definitions are provided by a reference data service. There are other things that are relevant to ADAPT that are provided by reference data services as well. ADAPT contains a representation system and unit system that can be provided 
that are provided via XML and loaded at runtime so they're remotely updatable. There are other types of reference data. There are ag gateway projects in the process of creating specifications for, specifically crop protection products, equipment, and other common vocabularies that are needed for data exchange. The application data model also contains collections of reference layers, which might be soil maps, background imagery. The reference layers are able to accommodate both raster and vector data. The application data model also contains a collection of documents. These are really the workhorse chunks of data within the common object model. This is where you represent plans, recommendations, work orders, and work records which are essential in the exchange between FMIS systems or between a grower and their third-party service provider. The core documents, which were identified in the SPADE series of projects, are plans, which denote this is how we're going to grow a crop this season, observations and measurements, which describe what's happening in the field, Recommendations, which describe what we recommend we do about the observations and measurements that have been made. Work orders, which state what we're going to do, and work records, which state what we actually did. The document is a base class from which plans, recommendations, and work orders and work records are derived. We have the ability to establish relationships between these different documents. So a plan could result in a recommendation, which then resulted in a work order, which then later resulted in a work record. All of these objects aren't necessary. Uh, it's simply the framework in which we see, most often, production agriculture data existing. These were the buckets that we were able to identify that data often falls into. I hope that this overview has been useful to you. As I said, there will be additional webinars occur that go into much more depth about the different parts of this. I hope this has been informative. Back to you, Jim. Thank you, Stuart. Well done. And thanks to all of you who are interested in learning about Ag Gateway, its activities, and its resources. Be sure to check out other videos in the Ag Gateway Global Network video series. Take care and goodbye.